Welcome to the Zoe Ralph Leadership Podcast, your source of strategies and insights to make you a better leader. Influence, improve, inspire. Well, welcome to the podcast. Today's guest is an amazing stalwart guru in the field of leadership education and uh, personal development and evolution of the hum- of humanity, really. So I'm actually thrilled to have Lisa Leahy on the call today. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She was most recently the Associate Director of Change Leadership Group at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And this was a project that was nationally funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop greater internal capacity for leading organizational improvement in the national school public schools district. So that's an interesting little project, bit little, massive project that you've been involved with in terms of overhauling the schools in um, the United States. So that's fabulous. So aside from that little project, she is the founder and co-founder and co-director of Mindset Work, which is a consulting group that works with senior leaders and teams in corporations, government, nonprofits. Um, she's worked across the educational spectrum from K-12 to colleges to universities and boards, um, across the whole range, really, of people doing stuff together. She is an author and uh, co-author of Immunity to Change, a famous text and probably one of the most recommended textbooks in any leadership development uh, program that I've been involved with. And this is how to overcome, uh, Immunity to Change, how to overcome it and unlock the potential in yourself and organizations and your organization. And she co-wrote that with Robert Keegan. She also co-wrote How the Way We Talk Can Change the Way We Work and co-author of Change Leadership, A Practical Guide to Transforming Our Schools. And um, one of the latest books that come out that she's uh, co-authored with is An Everyone Culture, Becoming a Deliberately Developmental Organization, which is a fantastic book in terms of how you get an organization to take development as its central premise and tend it to, to the very soul of its being and helping its people evolve in the service of the organization's purpose. So I'm excited to talk about all that. Um, mm. There is so much to get through in the body of your work, so I'm really, really thrilled that you're here. And uh, you teach executive development programs at Harvard and Notre Dame and is a passionate pianist and hiker. Yay! So I love this personal part. My husband plays piano, um, oh. and I'm the av- I'm the avid uh, hiker. So let me start first of all by saying thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's really my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's a treat. <laughs> oh, it's a treat for me. Let me assure you. And the first question I have is: Okay, let's talk hiking, <laughs> since I am an <laughs> avid adventurist. What are some of the best hikes that you've done? Well, that's a great question. And the very first one that comes to my mind is actually out your way, which is the Milford Trek in New Zealand. Wow. And that's in the South Island. And it is absolutely magnificent. It's a multi-day trip. And um, I, I had one of the most wonderful experiences on that particular hike, because you're hiking with all kinds of people from all over the world. It's such a uh, a well-regarded trek and it's so well organized and there you are basically somebody's taking care of all, all of your needs other than you have to just wear your day pack and walk and just take in all of the extraordinary scenery which is just amazing because you're in the mountains you're in the temperate rainforest it's in the fjordland national park there and it's just absolutely beautiful so I would say that is probably my top one um, hike. But then there's a whole bunch of other ones in Canada and in the United States. There's so many beautiful, beautiful hikes. So if we want to spend all of our time on this, I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. We might save that for a conversation later because it will just get stuck going through all the fabulous places to walk. Um, I love how, oh, yes. you know, and similarly, I think um, I'm appreciating the glory of having a supported walk. And I did my first supported walk with a group earlier this year on the Lair Pinta Trail out of Alice Springs, which I completely highly recommend. It's another astounding uh, landscape. You can put that on your bucket list if you haven't been through there. And Excellent. No, I haven't. Thank you for that tip. 
<laughs> um, it is it is stunning, stunning country. Very different to Milford Sound, which is very green and lush and watery, and as New Zealand South Island is. And this is the inner heart of Australia. So we're talking desert landscape, and it's uh, which amazingly is full of life. And I think it's because I'm getting a little bit older, but to have somebody transport your pack and not have to do it hard is something that's very attracted, attractive for me now. <laughs> I have to say, you know, this is how being grateful, I can say, yes, it is indulgent, but I'm really grateful for it. <laughs> happy, happy, you know, that we can, we have the, you know, the privilege to be able to do it. Um, but I think we would both say that there are lots of amazing walks that you can go to where it's just a day hike and you don't even need all that stuff. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. You don't have to go on a major expedition. And it's interesting about talking about the change in how, how I've done expeditions. And I suspect you're similar in terms of appreciating the luxury version is that mm-hmm. that's a change that was easy to adapt to. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a beautiful segue. I can hear where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're on to me. Um, because we're here to talk about change, and that's a, the, a huge body of your work is around change and how people are immune to change or find difficult or find it difficult. So the question is, you know, why is some change so easy, like adapting to glamping, and why is some change so hard? <laughs> well, you know, it's a really interesting question that you're asking. And the example that we have in mind, what I'd like to say is it was easy for us, but it is not necessarily predictably easy for everyone. As a matter of fact, I can think of a number of people right off the top of my mind who would actually be very, very uncomfortable going on a trip where they were supported in the way that we're describing here. And that will get to this um, reality I've come to understand through my work, which is that change is hard for any of us as individuals, as well as for organizations, when there's some kind of loss or threat to our most precious unconscious identities. And so if I use the, our hiking as an example, uh, I can think of somebody who actually quite recently I did one of these immunity to change maps with. And one of the things that got exposed in that is that she has a immunity around things that are about finances and her using finances in ways that she feels inevitably are putting her in a position of privilege and in the process meaning that other that she separates herself from other people. And she's just the most recent example I could think of, but it was it's so fresh in my mind. And you know, she has a whole set of assumptions about what that would mean about her, that she would be a sellout, that she would no longer be a, like really belonging to the family she grew up in, who who struggled so hard to create equity. Um, so, you know, it's just a small example. But essentially what it all has in common is when we are losing something that's precious to us and we don't always know what what that even is and we're not aware of it. And so maybe the more technical way to say this is that what makes change so hard is that we all have unconscious goals. And if we're really going to be able to change our behaviors, we have to first understand that the unconscious goals are driving our behaviors right now, you know, in an unconscious hidden way. And actually it is making our current behaviors brilliantly effective. (laughs) Um, Right. And that's the issue. We we're just totally unaware of it. Mm, We just know that we can't change our behaviors. And so we feel stuck. That's right. And we feel stuck. And, you know, in some respects, that's the nicest way we can be to ourselves. And what has led me to be more invested in doing this work. And it is actually why I'm happy to be having this conversation with you, because getting the word out is just so important to me. What often happens is we end up not being able to create the change that we intend. And we start 
feeling really badly about ourselves. And it undermines our own sense of our capability. We start experiencing ourselves as people who are losers or who aren't really very serious or who can't make anything really important happen. And it becomes like an albatross. And I want everybody to know who's listening to this that when we take on a change goal, and we don't appreciate or understand that there's this whole interior unconscious landscape that is present. And and if we don't understand that, we will naturally go at the change process in a way that from the very moment we start, we are doomed to fail because we're not taking into account what is one of the most powerful forces of what is getting in our way. And that are these things I'm calling hidden goals or hidden commitments, the unconscious world. It's almost as if there's it's a war between at least two selves, the, the aspirational self that is dedicated to change and then there's the unconscious self that is dedicated to maintaining status quo um yes and until you surface that then you can't resolve the two is that is that your understanding and and i think that's i think that's a great way to cast it yes yes and it's true for all of us we all have aspirations and we all have unconscious processes that are really driving us you can call them our shadows. You can call them any number of things. Uh, but until we actually recognize them and embrace them and see them for what they are and then take on the work that's required for us to not be merged with them or beholden to them, that's when we can start creating the space so that we can actually change because we're changing our innards, not just seeking to change our behaviors, which can't change uh, when they're without addressing the unconscious stuff, if that's really the, you know, a, a main force at play. So maybe it would be good for me to share an example with you um, just to give people a sense of what it is that I'm talking about in a more concrete way. And I want to use an example that many people have talked with me about, and that is the goal of wanting to lose weight or to lead a more wholesome (laughs) lifestyle. I'm so glad you picked that one. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I think that's pretty universal. I hear this all the time from my clients and something that I live through in my family as well. So I think that would be really useful. And I know that you've, I just saw that on your website yesterday. You've got a book out, out on this. Is that correct? Yes, we, we actually do. It's called right weight, right mind. And we, we, because this goal is so uh, popular, we decided to write a book that just focuses on how can you approach your health in a very novel way that is going to actually lead to sustained change. And so the process starts with what we call creating an immunity to change map. And what the map does is allow you to see what are the various parts of me that are actually alive in the in what I'm trying to do here. So to the point you just made, there's my aspirational self. And for most of us, that is actually pretty easy to access. I have longings. I have wishes. There are things I want to get better at. And so let's go with this idea in the example that I want to actually basically be taking better care of my body. And I know it means losing weight. And my goal is to really help myself to be leading a a more wholesome lifestyle and losing weight. Okay. So that's the first step in the whole process. Then the second step is an invitation to do a what we call a fearless inventory of what are the actual behaviors you're engaged in that lead you to basically be working against yourself. So it's a really a time to be very honest with yourself. And so, you know, people will say things like, okay, I eat more than I need to. I eat past my full point. I drink more alcohol than I need to. I 
you know, sit down with a carton of ice cream and I, you know, I'm halfway through before I say enough for it, whatever it is. But there are all those kind of, quote unquote, telling on ourselves uh, behaviors. And those are very important because those are actually the breadcrumb trails that help us to understand what is actually the unconscious driver of those behaviors. Because those behaviors aren't just coming out of nowhere. They're actually serving some really brilliant goal, an unconscious goal. So what might that be? And what I'd say is, because we've had spent so much time with people who have this goal, what we've discovered are there's a whole host of goals that people can have. But I, I'll just give you a couple of examples of things that are, uh, you just don't think this is what's going on. So here's, there, is a, there are a bunch of people who do not want to lose their autonomy or their independence or spontaneity by following a diet. They're just like, I, I refuse to be, you know, being told what to do. And that's, that's the unconscious goal. Like, I will not be somebody else's, you know, tell, have somebody else tell me what to do. For other people, it's something like, you know, and this is true in basically like where I am in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where people can often feel like, I just, I don't want to appear vain or that I care about something as superficial as my looks. You know, to, I live in a community that tends to be very oriented towards people's intellect. And so there's a part of them that feels like shameful of appearing to be vain or caring about how I look. Mm. And then there's a whole group of people. And I'd say we've actually discovered a lot of people have some version of this one, which is to not run the risk of being rejected by or excluded from like friendships or family, yeah. you know, like feeling like I, I, somehow this singles me out and it makes me different from my group. And I don't want to do anything that puts me at risk of not belonging. So it's just giving you a few examples of, OK, well, if you've got big unconscious drivers like the ones that I've just described, you could see how what you're doing is unintentionally sabotaging your aspiration to really get to be in control of your eating. And uh, that makes sense. It absolutely does. And those things are so incredibly powerful. And even when we do this work and we surface these uh, conflicting intentions or unconscious goals and to intellectually go, well, that's all stupid <laughs> or that's not helping. Exactly. You. It, that's not the change <laughs> part, right? That's not the part where you actually change. So, <clears throat> No, it isn't. No, it isn't. I mean, that's just another way we can be really hard on ourselves. And the, the point of getting to this uh, place in the exercise, which is only we're now only up to the third step of what's a multiple step process. But yeah. right now, the point is to just honor that actually what I have there in that column, what we call column three, our unconscious commitments actually served me very, very well at some point in my life, like to belong or to not be vain or to, to be autonomous. Those were really important things. But now what's happening this many more years in our adulthood, it's been our unconscious go-to strategy. And it is no longer actually serving us in these ways that are, are just, you know, straight up unconditional. And sometimes they may work, but more often than not, they are working against our being able to be our best self witness. You know, I'm not going to be able to take good care of my health in this example. So we need to be kind to ourselves. And I think that's one of the key things, which is to not poo poo what is in our unconscious, because it was there as a very brilliant strategy when we were younger to get our needs met. And, you know, now we have to catch up with the fact that we are older and we actually have a lot more capability than we did back then. But we do have work to do to begin to let go of what is our default system right now. You know, our inner wiring just automatically goes to this thing I'm calling our unconscious goal. And it's been fed to <laughs> stay with the metaphor of, of the eating here, but I mean, no matter what goal you're working on, our unconscious goals are fed 
like incessantly because they just keep operating without out our knowing it. And we just keep living in that world where we keep satisfying that particular unconscious need without recognizing how much it is actually getting in our way around being able to be our best or bigger self. So here's the million dollar question. Now that we've surfaced all these unconscious goals and we're aware that we're sabotaging ourselves, how do we change our wirings? <laughs> how do we actually do the shift? Yes. Yes, yes. So um, what I've now just described to you in those three steps is seeing your immune system. Now you understand why every time, you know, if you think of your column one, which we call the improvement goal, as putting your foot on the gas of an accelerator in a car, and you think of this, what I'm calling column three, your competing commitment, as you're putting your foot on the brake on the car, you can see here what we've got is a dynamic system where there's lots of energy going in, keeping you basically exactly where you are at status quo. But the first step is you've got to really see that's what's going on. And that no matter how much you, you know, you set out to use your willpower and your discipline to change your behaviors, it's really important at this point of the, the unfolding of the process to understand why that actually won't work. Because no amount of willpower is actually now getting to your unconscious goal. So we would say that's a really important threshold for someone to cross. Like, do you, do you, can you grok? how having this unconscious goal be applying the foot to the brake really is the thing that if you could work on how to lift your foot up off the brake, do you see how you'd be able to actually have more momentum with the car going forward with your column one goal? And the way that we can help somebody to do that is then to start identifying, and this is the fourth step in the process, what we call big assumptions. What are the beliefs that you currently hold that many times we aren't aware of them, but, but they, they're assumptions that guide us in a way that lead us to have to believe we have to protect ourselves the way that we do. So if I use the example of, uh, you know, in column, my column three unconscious goal is um, I, what was the one that I was using before? It was something like I, I I, I never want to appear vain or as if I care about my looks. Somebody could be holding the assumption that says something like to be taking care of myself and my well-being is vain. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a pretty important big assumption to identify because anytime it, that means anytime you engage in self-care, you will see yourself as vain and you'll back off of that. Okay, but what would happen if you were in a place, now I'll carry that example further, where you might be willing to test out the possibility that you can take care of yourself and not be selfish or vain? So like, can you imagine the universe where that's true? I just have a question that um, just to test one of, if one of these thoughts or one of these beliefs is actually fits into this category as well or whether you have to phrase it in a particular way. So the one that you just mm -hmm. described is if I take care of myself, then I'm being vain is a similar mm -hmm. assumption, big assumption, something like um, people will judge me if, if I'm thin. People will judge me if I'm thin, like people will judge me. Yes. So Especially that's for being in any vain. number of ways. Yeah. So yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And people judge me. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. That's almost a, that's an embedded assumption in there, which is, and being seen as vain is bad. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. So it's kind of like and a cluster of awesome. thoughts around the whole thing, really. Exactly. Exactly. So we want to get to um, a list of rich, big assumptions that are, are um, beliefs you hold that are keeping you at the mercy of that column three commitment to, you know, never appear vain or to never appear like you are that you care about how you look. Uh, and once we have those, then the individual is invited to basically choose one that he or she is interested in actively pursuing, finding out that it is not 
100% correct. Because what is currently happening in anybody's system is their big assumption, they are just believing un, without any critical faculty that it's their big assumption is correct. And that's actually why they keep themselves in the very difficult position they are of wanting to um, take better care of themselves, for example. But they can't because they don't realize how much this is really the thing that's keeping them from being able to change their behavior ultimately because something bad is going to happen to them. They, they unconsciously believe if they were to act, actually take consistent actions towards taking care of themselves because there we have the makings of being seen as vain and vain is bad. So I've got an example around this and I'm wondering if this probably leads into the next step. So I've got a client who, when she surfaced some of these assumptions, one of them was, if I look after myself, my mother won't love me anymore because I'm putting myself, mm. my needs ahead of hers. And yeah. She re like she was imagining, imagining testing this and imagining that it was true and that her mother really wouldn't love her as much. And so it was, did not want to start testing that assumption. So does that come yes. up for your clients? Tell me about it. Yes, because that's a great example where somebody feels like this assumption is so true that I can't possibly risk the idea of finding out that it's not true because... I will, I, I, in my, in my every, you know, cell in my body believe it's just so true. So I can't risk that. And what we say is that in order to actually conduct a, a, a test of a big assumption, you can't activate your immune system because it won't let you then feel safe enough to test your big assumption. So we might then try to back up a little bit with um, somebody who has got an assumption like that and see if there are other assumptions that cluster with that one uh, that she would be willing to take a look at. And it might be something that would be looking at, for example, and I'm making this up because I don't know your client, obviously, but like, does your client have a sibling? And mm -hmm. can you, if, if she could see that actually her sibling is also very loved by her mother and her sibling is able to actually pursue some of his or her needs. In other words, that it's not an either or, that it's possible to do an and both here of serving my needs and actually serving my mother's needs. And so she's not taking the risk herself She's looking outside of herself for data that would help her to see it isn't quite as black and white as she believes it is. Yeah, I think definitely we can um, have a look at that. And I think that's a that's a great, uh, great way to tackle it. It's kind of rather than going for the big juicy one that is the biggest block is just to uh, unravel it a little bit and go for the smaller threads, if you like. And that's definitely yeah, an avenue. We can that's look at. right. That's right. And another very safe kind of test that we often encourage people to think about in, in a, uh, as an early set of tests is to do what we call a retrospective. Like, has there been any time in her past where actually she did have needs that she um, needed to actually express? So I'm just going to make this up, but I imagine there's a time that she was sick and that she had needs that her mother needed to respond to and that her mother still loved her. Beautiful. That would be a kind of an example. Now, you know, I know that's a complex example in some respects because she could be saying, yeah, but my mother didn't have a choice there and she knew I needed her and, you know, that kind of thing. But okay, but can you still see that these are not so either or? Yeah, I think we can definitely pursue that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. So that's sort of where we start testing the assumption process. Is that step four or five? Uh, the testing of big assumption follows the fourth step, which is identifying a list of the big assumptions that you hold that keep you having to um, basically have the goal, the unconscious goal you do in column three. So what we talk about in step five is let's begin to develop a more 
mindful relationship to our big assumption, which can include very importantly beginning to test your big assumption. But we also so test five. If we were to just call um, sorry test five, that's not what I meant. Step five is what I meant. If we just called step five the follow up work to having a good, robust immunity to change map, which you could say collectively all those first four steps really is like this diagnostic. What is my immune system and what are the big assumptions underlying it? Let's call that like the first phase of work. Then the second phase is all about developing this relationship to your big assumption, which heretofore has been, you've been totally fused with. You know, you, you, you haven't even known those are the lenses you've been operating from. So everything in this next phase of the work is about, if we use the metaphor of let's take my glasses off and let me take a look at my glasses and turn them around and ask questions about those lenses. Like, are they distorted or are they always leading me to see true things? Are they leading me to like avoid seeing certain things and always focusing on other things. And that's pretty much what everything in that, uh, the real work phase of overturning your immune system is about. So we encourage people to very simply start by developing their observational muscles. Like just watch yourself. When do you see your big assumption appearing and you being in a place where now Oh, I'm, I see myself. I see here's one of those moments. I'm assuming that if I were to make a mistake, I would be seen as a fool. Wow. It's happening. Not just at work. It's happening. Wow. I'm in a, I'm in a store and, and I can't figure out how to use, you know, the credit card thing. All of a sudden I'm feeling like a fool here. Like, wow. I start beginning to really notice how much that big assumption has been at play in my life. And that often helps you to see what are going to be some rich but safe places where you can begin to test your big assumption. And, you know, the testing becomes iterative. You can't, it's not just one test of your big assumption. It's more like three and four and five. So you have to be willing to basically take the time to, you know, go slow in order to go deep and create lasting change. So that's a question that comes up then. It's like, because people want instant fixes, how much time does this change process actually take for folks? In my experience, it be- you can begin to see changes in your mindset and consequently your ability to behave differently in about four months. Wow. It becomes even more sustainable and you feel greater clarity and confidence the more you continue to test. So we would say like when we do um, immunity to change coaching cycles with people, it's a five to six month process. And by the end of that process, the majority of people are in a place where they are well into having created sustainable change around their aspirations. That's amazing. And so in the work that you've done in your book, Right Weight, Right Mind, a question I have around this, because people, people are, who have been in, on, you know, they've done every diet, they've tried absolutely everything, can feel a little, I imagine, a little reluctant to try yet another thing. In your experience, what is the difference between those who are successful and those who aren't when they tackle this kind of work? Or <laughs> does everybody tackle this kind of work are they successful? So what, what is the success factor that's needed to go through this process? Mm, that's a really great question. So I'll start with saying that let's go with this idea of these two big phases. One is this quote unquote diagnostic where you get to see your immune system. What is it with what my foot on the gas, my foot on the brake and the set of big assumptions that keep my foot on the brake? I would say that in our experience, the, by far the majority of people are successful at seeing their immune system and being able to identify big assumptions that are powerfully holding them back. When it comes to really the more kind of important pieces, once you've done that, 
entering and sustaining the work in phase two. And there I would say you definitely have people drop off because, Mm -hmm. first of all, there are some people who even after they see their immune system, they feel like defeated by how long it's going to take. And so they decide they don't want to do it. But really, I think for many people, it's because it's scary. It's really it's, this process is so different from our usual technical approaches mm-hmm. where, you know, we can just plug in, oh, here's the diet. Let me just do this. But what we're saying is that's not going to work if you are not able to actually get in on the inner landscape there of your own inner being. Well, you know, it's not really comfortable looking at our feelings, for example, just staying with the the weight loss example, our feelings of um, not wanting to be excluded or feeling like a loser for not being able to actually lose any weight. I'd rather just not actually feel all those things or be aware of that. And I would say this is really one of the bigger forces that keeps us at the mercy of being unable to change, which is we, we tend to carry sets of assumptions about our own capacity to deal with difficult feelings. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we tend to live in a society that is actually saying much more of this. Don't, you know, your feelings are really like, <laughs> you know, to be poo-pooed. We need to be operating as rational people and we need to approach our lives this way. So we get a lot of messages that underscore our own discomfort with, or, or that encourage us to not allow ourselves to be discomfort, uncomfortable with our feelings. And that's what's coming up in our unconscious column, uh, you know, our goals, their fears. So can I really allow myself to have the feeling that this is really going to be ultimately something I may not actually be able to control to begin with, but have faith that there is a very reliable process that we've now been doing for decades that we can say to people, if you are willing to do this, and better yet, if you have a partner who you're doing this work with, so you're not all alone and then in your own kind of system telling yourself, I don't really have to do this. It's so hard to do change work all by yourself. Um, So, so I, I, I've, I'm going on too long with that answer, but essentially the, you know, the bottom line is if you do decide you want to do the work and you can sustain yourself in the work, which I'm saying will be helped by having somebody who you're working with either a peer or you hire a coach to help you with somebody like yourself, I would say you have a very high likelihood of succeeding as long as you keep being able to remember that what we're trying to do is to not directly change our behavior, but instead begin to test the validity of our mindset. And in the process of learning that it is not 100% correct, that is how we begin to, through the back door, be able to create sustainable behavior change. I love it. And I think that um, a couple of critical points that I want to highlight. One is this whole idea of learning how to feel is, is one of the critical parts of being able to do this work. And I think you're absolutely spot on with that because we're taught uh, in Western culture in particular, and I know in other cultures as well, that feeling is not so good. You know, don't cry, bury the thing. Um, keep a stiff right. upper lip, all that kind of stuff. And that's true of Australian culture as, as well as North American culture. And it keeps uh-huh. us from being able to process that energy in the emotion. So that's, that's a core part of the work. And you know what? Once you learn how to do that, it's so much easier <laughs> because you're, you don't have to be a prisoner to your feelings anymore. Of course. And I think that's a, a really important point that you make <laughs> because me. one of the things that, of course, is likely to happen is if I drink the Kool-Aid that says, no, you really should not be paying attention to your feelings, how am I ever going to get better at learning how to deal with them, right? Yeah. It's, it's, of course, I should actually assume I don't know how to do this, but the real assumption most people are making is, and I never will. 
And I think that's the assumption that is incorrect because there's lots and lo loads of data at this point, especially with Daniel Goleman's work on emotional intelligence, that says there are actually reliable processes that can help people learn how to identify and manage their emotions. Mm, yeah. Oh, and what a great gift to the world was his body of work, that's for sure, in terms yes. of learning about emotions and naming them and uh, processing them and... Yeah, that's critical. So let me recap the, the couple of steps that we've covered so far. So the first one is to have a change goal. Next, uh, step two is to identify all the, what did you call it? The fearless inventory a behavior. Fearless, <laughs> a fearless self-inventory. That's right. Of your behaviors, not your attitudes or feelings, just actual things you do and don't do okay. that work against your column one goal. All right. So stuff you're doing that doesn't support that. And then... Column three is to surface your assumptions, or did I go jump a step? Yeah, that's you jumped a step. Column three is where you identify your unconscious hidden goal. Okay, yeah. We have two steps that are part of this uh, that column. Uh, and the first one is uh, a very simple but hugely powerful one, which is to say to people, now that you've done column two, try to imagine yourself in real time of doing the opposite of each of those behaviors that you just wrote and take them one at a time and let yourself really feel it in the gut. What are the worries or fears that come up for you as you imagine doing the opposite? And this is where you start really tapping into that emotional life. So if I like imagine stopping, oh, you know, just that, say I had that behavior in column two of like overeating. I ate way past, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no longer full. Imagine you're going to stop before you are full. What's the worry or fear? Okay. So then for somebody, it might be my, my worry or fear is, I'm going to lose all of the, the kind of sense of spontaneity in my life, or I'm going to lose the, like the way I can dull my, my feelings, or, I mean, there's a whole, there's um, really dozens of different things. People, it's so individual at that point, mm. but, but the key is you need to identify what's your particular fear and you stay with it. It's not just one fear. Usually it's a bunch of fears. And then once you've got what we say, you've completed your fear box, then you basically take this uh, idea that you, you don't just have the worry or fear, but there's that part of you that's committed to making sure the thing you're worried about never happens. And that is your hidden competing goal. So if I had that worry that I'll lose all spontaneity, the goal is to never lose my spontaneity, period. Mm -hmm. Or if it's, um, I feel like, oh, I worry I'll start be being seen sexually, like I'll lose the weight and I'll be seen sexually. And the, then the, the commitment is to never be looked at sexually. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very related to the fear, but you're basically just putting it in a language that owns that there is a part of you actively expending energy to make sure that worry doesn't happen. And that is that your unconscious goal. So there we have, um, that's our third step in the process. Mm -hmm. And then step four is to tease out these assumptions and to start testing them. Is that right? Exactly. It's just to tease them out. Okay. Let's just get them out there. And now we've completed the whole phase one map making process. Now, do you want to continue? Do you actually want to do the work of overturning your system? And if the answer to that is yes, then we begin by focusing in on one of those big assumptions the person's willing to test and explore. And then we start that phase of maybe doing some observations first and uh, beginning to do some tests, some very safe tests of big assumptions. And that's, that's really the heart of the work. And that's why it takes time. Uh, the map making process only takes, you could do it, you know, to just follow the process in the book. It could take you an hour or 90 minutes and you could sleep on it and, you know, maybe make a few tweaks to it. That's, that's really the illuminating insight part. But now you actually have to work the insight that you have unconscious goals and yeah. that's what takes time. Yeah. 
I get that because those things are so ingrained. It's like you've walked across um, a grassy patch of land for so long that you've worn a path to start building a new path takes effort um, to change exactly. the faults. So I have exactly. this, I have a, something that left to mind as you're talking about this. So if we can surface, if we have these behaviors that aren't supporting us, and this totally makes sense on an individual basis, does it also make sense from looking at this immunity map from an organizational basis? So, for example, an organization might have behaviors that aren't really support in, in the organization that aren't supporting what the organization is about. Uh, so it might be unethical behaviors or it might be toxic culture, that kind of stuff. Can you use yeah. this process to apply to a group of people or a collective consciousness that, that is an organization? Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing that we always encourage people to do before they move to that level, however, is to understand we all have individual immunities because seeing it at the individual level really helps people to understand what is an immune system. When you take it to the collective level, it's the very same process, but it's more complex because you have to have alignment on, on, on responses. So identifying, for example, a column one collective improvement goal, we actually have to have a conversation with the group of people. Let's just make it a little bit easier and say it's a top team. That, that team has to have a conversation in which they are able to come to some consensus about, well, what is the right improvement goal for us? And, you know, some groups are actually enacting their immune system as they try to do that work and can't even come to closure on it. Mm. But let's say they do. Okay. Let's say they do. Then they move to the second column. And now the question is, what are the, uh, again, it's an on, honest quote unquote self inventory where self is the whole team. And now the challenge is for that team to be looking at its own behaviors as they work together and genuinely, honestly answer the question of what are we doing and not doing that works against that goal we just agreed to. And importantly, it's not what are the people outside doing, you know, like <laughs> those people, those, those terrible people, you know, it's very easy to go to the blame and pointing fingers outside of the, the team there. So you got to really help them stay and look at that. Then you go to the third column. And again, it's like, what are we really fearful of, afraid of, if we would actually do the opposite of those behaviors? And, you know, this is really a delicate kind of a conversation because essentially it leads to the elephant in the room having to be named. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have skillful facilitators to hold the conversation uh, so that people can feel like it is safe to have to be naming those things because it is all in the name of helping that team to become more functional. And then you get to the big assumption. So we've done this lots of times with teams, with organizations, collectives, and the work is very much the same. It's now that you've actually had a set of conversations you've never had before, which itself is an intervention. So the diagnostic is really often very, very powerful and meaningful for people. Now, which of these big assumptions are you willing to take on? And when you've got a collective, it's really one of the wonderful things is you could be running multiple experiments at once because you've got clusters of people who can run various, you know, different tests, and then they come back together and talk about what they learned about. And all of this is in our book. And, you know, it took us a long time to write that Immunity to Change book because we wanted it to have real cases in it. Mm -hmm. And we talk about how, you know, like a medical uh, educational model got changed. There's all kinds of really rich and real examples at the collective level about what you can do. Yeah. So um, for those listening, this I will put links to all of Lisa's books and examples of her speaking again in great detail on the immunity map on various YouTube channels on the podcast uh, notes page, which is zoerath.com slash podcast slash immune, I-M-M-U-N-E. So all that good stuff will be there. 
on the on the podcast page notes. So we'll make sure that all that all those resources are there for folks uh, because all the books are amazing. Like your your work is so astonishing in its depth and um, the fact that it's based on real life application and, and great case studies that you can actually convert convert transform cultures in many different ways. And I think it's um, this work is so beneficial because you know what? There's so many people that go to work miserable and we're yeah. even day to day in their lives miserable. And it doesn't have to be that way that, that this process of self inquiry of gentle self inquiry really is, is possible to transform your entire life experience. And I think that's what's astonishing and beautiful about the work that you do. Oh, thank you so much. And and I would say if people are interested in thinking about this in this more robust way around how an organization can actually provide the supports for this kind of work in an ongoing way. So it's not like somebody having to, you know, summon up the courage to do this by themselves, but it's part of actually how they work in a day-to-day way, I really encourage you to take a look at our most recent book, An Everyone Culture, because that's that's what it's about. I know. We haven't even touched on that, on that book, but we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, we kind of needed to go from like the, the core central work that you do, and then it kind of morphs out into organization yes. and cultural peace. And I think it's astonishing what you've captured in that book. And Again, that book will be put on the uh, show notes page. What is the best website to send people to to have a look at your work, Lisa? Well, one website is mindsatwork.com, and that is the home of Immunity to Change. The other website is Way to Grow, and that's the home of the Deliberately Developmental Organization. And if people are interested in that, we're actually going to be having a workshop in the States in February, and sorry, in October um, this year. And we're really excited to be in a place where we've got, you know, real materials since the book has been written to, re- to help people begin to incorporate this into their own practices. And where are you running the workshop? In Cambridge, Massachusetts. In your hometown. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, make life easier for yourself. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, well, make sure all that is on the podcast uh, notes page as well. Fabulous. So, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and the enormous body of work that you've you've brought to the world and your delightful energy. It's just been a pleasure speaking with you today. Oh, thank you, and thank you for the work that you do and that you're doing these podcasts and there you're getting these different ideas out there in the world, not just mine, but that you're, this is how you're spending your time bringing your energies to the world as you do. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.